Good evening, Beaverton. Thank you for joining me for tonight's virtual town hall on the city's response to COVID-19. I'm Abigail Elder, the director of the Mayor's Office Department, and I'm your host for tonight. So before I introduce our panelists, please note that attendees are muted and not on the screen, but we still want to hear from you. You can submit your questions anytime using the Q&A function on the bottom ribbon of your screen. Spanish interpretation is available also on the bottom ribbon of your screen. This town hall is being recorded and it will be available on the city's website in the next couple of days. So with that, I wanna introduce uh, City Council. They are, uh, and I'm gonna have them wave as I say their names. So Mayor Denny Doyle, Council President Laura Mitchell, Councilor Kate Arnold, Councilor Lacey Beatty, Councilor Mark Fagan, and Councilor Mark Sansusi. In addition to City Council, the other people you see on the screen are members of the city's leadership team. So I'll have them wave as well. They are Human Resources Director, Patricia Anderson Wick, Library Director, Glenn Ferdman, Police Chief Rhonda Groshan, Public Works Director Chad Lynn, who I think is on joining us by phone right now, Emergency Manager Mike Muma, Finance Director Patrick Eau Claire, Community Development Director Cheryl Tweedy, and not, I'm not yet seeing him, but joining us on the phone will be City Attorney uh, City Attorney Bill Kirby. Thank you all for being here tonight. The novel coronavirus and COVID-19 have created an unprecedented and constantly changing situation in our world and in our city. The city's done a great job of responding and supporting the recovery uh, in our city. So Mayor Doyle, could you share a bit about how the city business has continued during this time? Sure, be happy to. Thank you, Abigail. Well, good evening, Beaverton. Um, last month on March 13th, to do solve problems quickly, we closed our buildings. We are offering most city services via phone and online, and it's working. Uh, thanks to a lot of work from staff, uh, public works, police, inspections, and other services are continuing. The library is doing things. We expanded and extended our shelter services. And this week we started a central donation point for food. To food banks. So that's, that's a highlight. We, we renew that uh, declaration of emergency every, every two weeks. Thank you. Great, thanks mayor. I know that you and city council have taken a number of actions to support the economic health of our businesses and residents. Council President Mitchell, can you tell us a bit about the city council's actions? Yeah, thanks, Abigail. I know that council has been eager to get in front of everybody just to make ourselves available and let everybody know that we've been working hard and long to make sure that we're addressing everything in our community. So far, and you know, this isn't the, the end of it and, and barely the beginning of it, we've uh, passed a residential eviction moratorium uh, we have uh, launched more than one million in aid. We've also launched grants for small businesses impacted by the governor's executive order to help pay rent. Now we've, our first phase helped 120 businesses and we're gonna launch our second phase soon. We also have provided some operating capital for business relief and recovery. We've um, created emergency, rent, uh, emergency rental assistance program um, and also uh, gave direct assistance to Meals on Wheels and some other nonprofits responding to the crisis. So we're happy to be here tonight. Great, thank you, Councillor. So we're gonna to go to questions now. Remember that you can type your questions in the Q&A box um, and I'll call on panelists when they raise their hands. So you'll see hands coming up and down. Um, and so with that, we're going to start with questions that we received uh, over this last week through email. Um, and my first question uh, is, 
I was wondering if Beaverton is considering any requirements for the use of masks in businesses that cater to the public. And I think our emergency manager who's had very little on his plate in the last couple of weeks is probably gonna take this question to start. Go ahead, Mike. So um, at this point, um, it's not really up to the decidity to make that determination. Um, it is a directive through public health. Um, there are actually, as, as of today, some stronger recommendations from the state on the use of masks, particularly in businesses where social distancing cannot be kept. Um, with that, um, those same businesses are, are asked that they should also require the members of the public, uh, their customers, to wear the masks as well. So, um, but I don't foresee the city itself taking a stand, mandating the mask or others, um, but we do support the uh, governor's recommendation and the recommendation from the CDC. Great, thank you, Mike. Councillor Fagan, would you like to add? And this was one of the issues that came up at the Human Rights Advisory Commission last night. And, and what they had asked for, or we talked about a little bit, was in, 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 not to the, um, requiring of masks, but something that we could issue that would talk about the appropriate use of masks. Uh, the concern was uh, for communities of color, especially for males, the concern of uh, going into businesses in, ma and in masks and uh, making sure that we are very clear to our businesses that this is something that you know, either we would recommend or require. Uh, so I think it's something that we need to talk about. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councilor Arnold, did you have a comment? I do. I agree. I think we need to do that. And it'll be really important for us to get the strongest message we can out to our, the people in our community about the safest things. So one, masks. Two, how to use those masks, because masks in and of themselves aren't enough. We need to get people understanding to have cloth masks. As soon as you go home, you take it off and throw it to be either washed or in bleach and then use the next one. So I think it's gonna be really important, especially if we wanna start getting back into starting to opening things up again, that everybody is being following best practices. Because again, this isn't amount of our own freedom, it's our, our responsibility to protect the people around us. So I hope we can do more. Great, thank you, Councillor. Looks like Mayor, would you like to say something? Hold on, Mayor, I think you're not muted. One second here. There, is that better? That's perfect, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. On behalf of our Clean Water Services uh, folks, do not flush the masks down the toilet. There are stoppages all over the system, all over the state. So please get in the habit of when you're done with it, if you can't wash and clean it, put it in the garbage. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mayor. Anyone else? All right, I'm turning to our sec second question. Will Governor Kate Brown's order to halt evictions be extended? And if not, is Washington County working on something to keep landlords from evicting tenants? Also, what is being done to help out minorities like Latino and other races? Councillor Mitchell? Well, as far as Washington County, I'm not quite sure what it is that they're doing, but I know that within the city, um, there's been a lot of discussion between the city and the counselors and making sure that we have culturally specific organizations um, that are aware and have available uh, funding, you know, that can get the message out there um, and that being specific for uh, certain cultures. So I know that's that's big on our agenda, making sure that not everybody who's just used to um, being, you know, privy to the city and what it is that we're doing, but just making sure that everybody in the entire community knows. Great, thank you. Councilor Sansusi. Yeah, I, I think it's also fair to say that if the state were to remove the statewide um, uh, eviction moratorium sometime soon, that it would be something that we would want to and probably need to at least discuss at city council to decide if we want to take action locally. Uh, hard to say yet uh, whether that would happen, but it's, it's certainly something that, that we're interested in talking about depending on what goes on at statewide. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Arnold? 
This is going to be a huge issue, not only for renters, but for the people who own homes. We have a wide variety of who can and can't afford to pay rent and also who relies on that money. For instance, some people, that's their, their, their savings. That's the only money they have coming in for income. Uh, and what we're going to have to do, we're in a response phase now. Setting up the moratorium is a response to this pandemic, but we're going to need longer long-term plans to get through recovery. And that's going to take not only us, but it's going to take working at the state level and with a lot of different groups because we all want to get through this. And that recovery is going to be a hard thing for us to be working on. I hope we've started it and I hope there's some serious discussions going on with our brightest minds to figure out how to get us all through this. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Would any city staff members like to add? Maybe I will mention that the city has uh, a helpline with uh, eviction moratorium assistance. You can find that on our website. Um, and if you go to beavertonoregon.gov slash coronavirus, you can find a link to all of our uh, COVID-19 related resources. Cheryl, go ahead. This is Cheryl Tweedy, our community development director. Hold on, Cheryl, you're, you're still muted. There okay, how about now? That's excellent, thank you. <laughs> I clicked. Um, I just wanted to add that there's actually a fair amount of information on the city's website, both for small businesses as well as for tenants. There's information about where you can go for different types of resources as a small business person, both Beaverton resources as well as those provided by other organizations. On the housing side, we've uh, established a hotline. We have an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions list that may be helpful to people. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be adding um, additional technical support to help people navigate through the unemployment system in Oregon. Uh, happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, Cheryl. All right, turning to our next question. How many Beaverton residents have contacted or contracted coronavirus and how many have died? How do these figures influence when our shelter in place might end? Mike Muma, please go ahead. And then I'll turn over to Councillor Sansusi. So um, up until this week, the numbers have only been kept at the uh, county level. That's all that the Oregon Health Authority has released was county level um, numbers. This week, they did send out in the weekly report um, the numbers by zip code level. So it's no, still not a perfect fit for um, the numbers in the city. Uh, and so um, any numbers you get is, is a combination of, of county and city. But just to give you an, an idea, uh, 97005, there was 21 cases. Um, these are confirmed um, these are, so we also know that there are probably a lot of cases beyond these confirmations. Um, for those 21 cases, that equates to basically eight and a half people for every 10,000 within that zip code. So it is a relatively low number of people relative to the over, overall population size. Um, in regards to how this impacts our um, shelter in place, uh, the criteria is set for um, to several criteria, actually, some in the, in the core capabilities of masks, PPE, um, and the hospital surge capacity. But within the uh, statistics area, it's basically we need to see declining numbers over a two-week period of symptoms and actual cases, confirmed cases. So once we start seeing that over a 14-day period, and the, as a county, we meet the other thresholds for um, surge capacity and protection and tracing uh, then they can uh, appeal to the governor for permission to uh, open up in phase one. Great. Thank you, Mike. Councillor Sansusi, go ahead, please. Yeah, just a couple of additional thoughts on this. Um, you know, this is information that I think the cities have been interested in seeing for quite some time uh, in, in that it gives us a better sense for what the, the level of COVID activity is in, in our community. But at the same time, I think the, the folks at the state and county health departments are right that there's only so much information you can gather from it. For instance, all it tells you is the, uh, the zip, well, even, even the address of residence of the person. It doesn't necessarily say where they've contracted the disease. It doesn't necessarily say what the point of contact was that led to it. 
so there's a whole lot of other variables that have to be taken into account, which is why the next phase of activity with the state and the counties is, is on contact tracing. And it's the contact tracing really that lets them find out more about how the cases are developing and where they're propagating from. Um, the extent to which the city can use this information remains to be seen, but I think that as the, as the process goes on, Mr. Muma and the, and, the, and the Emergency Operations Center will be more heavily involved in some of this activity that probably the county will be leading for us. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Any other, anyone else want to comment? Okay, thank you so much. Our next question is a money question. What is the estimated revenue shortfall and what steps have been taken at this time to make up for that shortfall? We have budget meetings coming up in the next couple of weeks. Patrick, our finance yes. director, Patrick Eau Claire, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Abigail. Very good question. So uh, the, the city, uh, when uh, we were going through what we call our internal review a budget review process before we bring it forward to the budget committee and the council for consideration. We went through a process of actually reducing the next year's budget um, by about uh, $6 million for the general fund and some of the uh, other funds of the city to accommodate for additional, for expected uh, revenue shortfalls that we anticipate. In, in total on, on what we call a kind of a, a best case scenario, it's going to be about $7.8 million uh, for uh, between a combination of the end of this fiscal year. There's, uh, there's three, uh, more months left of this fiscal year and then uh, in next fiscal year. So about $7.8 million this uh, combination of, of, of both this fiscal year and next fiscal year under the uh, best case scenario. Uh, we do have a worst case scenario that uh, it jumps to about uh, $9.6 million in revenue shortfalls. So we feel that we have really pretty much addressed what we need to in the interim period. Again, this is going to be a dynamic situation that's going to play out over the next um, six to 12 months. Uh, and at that time, we'll have a little bit better picture of uh, specific revenue sh um, impacts that we might see, such things as our uh, gas taxes that we receive from the state, uh, building permit revenues, uh, site development permit revenues, um, uh, transient lodging tax revenues will take a, a, a large hit uh, because of the reduction in uh, travel especially in the uh, area hotels for, for Beaverton and Washington County. So the city has, has taken uh, appropriate interim steps. We will be monitoring it uh, as we go each month by month to see how uh, revenues are continuing to be impacted with this uh, pandemic. All right, thank you, Patrick. Move on to our next question. What collaboration with other communities are we seeing on regional reopening plans? Does Beaverton plan to use some of its staff to supplement the County Health Department's contract tracing program? Councillor Beatty, please go ahead. Well, I can't talk about the, if we're gonna use our staff to supplement the county. I mean, I think it would take the county asking us and us looking at the budget to do it. But I do know this is criteria for opening. So it'll be interesting to see how the county maybe uh, repurposes and redirects some of their own staff to do this work. Um, and then I think if there was a shortfall, um, they would be the ones likely reaching out to cities for help. But with the kind of unemployment the way that it is, I think ramping people up to do this work makes a lot of sense. The state did it with the unemployment. I know they added like 400 people to answering unemployment calls. So I suspect we'll see something similar to this. Um, of course, that our government regionally partners on lots of things. One of the things that we've been doing, or a lot of us have been doing on Wednesday nights, is coordinating a call with elected leaders across the region from school board members, um, fire department, fire district members, uh, senators, federal senators, uh, our federal representatives, all coming to get together on idea sharing because we're all doing very unique things. THPRD um, is operating a shelter for the first time. They've never done it out of LC Stir. Other governments are doing very unique things that they weren't chartered or maybe we weren't thinking about doing. And so I think the idea of coming together and collaborating on new innovative things and learning from each other, one, helps us not create the wheel and it makes us for force multipliers. We're able to 
piggyback off each other's successes because there's no boundaries or geographical limits for COVID. And so we really have to operate and work together, especially from the elected leader side. Great, thank you, Councillor. I'm gonna turn it over to Mayor Doyle and then our Library Director, Glenn Ferdman. Yes, thank you, Abigail. Um, the, the county mayors meet once or twice a week with the county chair to discuss how different challenges are being met. We also talk uh, with our National League of Cities, the Oregon League of Cities, sharing ideas on how we can best handle this and what we're encountering. So as Councilor Beatty said, a lot, of, a lot of talking and a lot of sharing, and that's really how we try to operate here on, on the West Side. And I think it's working well because each city may have a different challenge and then it may become your challenge. And it's great to share that information. Thanks. Great, thank you, Mayor. Glenn, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Abigail. I'd like to mention two ways that mm -hmm. the Beaverton City Library is cooperating um, at the county level. One way is that Beaverton City Library, as a member library of the Washington um, County Cooperative Library Services, is engaged in countywide planning efforts for uh, reopening and what that might look like and it's part of a coordinated effort. The second thing I'd like to mention is that Beaverton City Library staff have been helping staff the county's uh, ebook and audiobook help desk. Great, thank you, Glenn. And I'll mention that the library has a lot of resources online at www.beavertonlibrary.org. Lots of good stuff out there. Uh, okay, now Linda asks, I'd like to hear more about specifics of donations to the food bank. Mike, Muma, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, this is uh, um, one of those new ventures that the, uh, as Councillor uh, Beatty pointed out, that we're getting into that is not traditional. Uh, we were asked by the county to take on a role of coordinating um, food distribution through food bank pantries in the Beaverton area. And part of the initial need we saw was that um, there was a lot of increase in demand for the pantry services, but um, the supply lines and the normal donations weren't typically there. And so our first step was to establish a kind of centralized donation point um, to take in food and then push out uh, to, or to the pantries in the area and support them. Um, this is not restricted just to city limits um, because we realize that the need goes beyond the city limits. And so we're coordinating more for an area of the, around the uh, Beaverton School District size. But you can go to the city's website um, and uh, find information there about the stuff we're looking to uh, accept. Uh, it is a curbside drop-off at Village Church, um, 330 Southwest Murray Boulevard. So you can pull up, open the trunk or the hatch or the door, a volunteer will take it out, or you have the option of taking it out of your car yourself, placing it on a table. Um, that way we keep the, the social distancing um, in place. Um, and it's uh, so far we've been able to push food out to um, Meals on Wheels and Home Plate for Youth. And we've only been open, uh, today was the fourth day. Great, thank you, Mike. Really important service. Our next question asks, has there been any increase of domestic violence during the stay home order? Councilor Beatty, go ahead. I'll let uh, the chief go first and then I'll, I'll talk after her. Go ahead, Great, chief. Thank you, chief. Uh, good evening. Uh, actually, we have not had an, an increase over the last six to eight weeks in domestic violence calls. Um, we have had uh, increases in crimes uh, property related crimes such as theft and burglary. But um, one would think we, we would have a spike in domestic violence uh, calls, but uh, so far that's, that's not been the case. Great, thank you. Councilor Beatty. I know the county sheriff came and talked to a bunch of elected leaders two weeks ago about this issue because it seems um, unbelievable that we haven't had an increase and in really thinking about why, right? If you're stuck at home with someone that's abusing you, you're very unlikely to call. There's really hard to move. So just because we're not seeing it doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I know um, teachers and educators are being vigilant when they're checking in with students, acting, um, listening, talking, looking for signs. I mean, it is happening. We just don't have a really good trace line because of the, the situation. So I know the DVRC um, is uh, taking calls and, and really trying to help people. So if, you, if there is someone in the community that you suspect this, offering them help is, is important to us. Great, thank you, Councillor. And Councillor, can you explain what DVRC stands for? The Domestic Violence Resource Center. Great, thank you. Our, 
Our next question is about uh, rental moratorium again. A rent moratorium is a great short-term solution. However, what happens when the deadline passes? Renters will be responsible for accruing the accruing payments then. My concern is a rental moratorium only prolongs the inevitable for renters, which is eviction later rather than now. Is it a rent moratorium freeze possible or something along those lines to keep our anxiety at bay? Councillor Mitchell, I'll let you answer. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think one of the good thing, or one of the things that we was good information. Um, our city attorney Bill Kirby let us know that the ORS statutes are the things that govern govern um, exactly who collects rent and and how that how they govern landlords and how it's done. So, you know, I think that we're on board and if we could do more, we absolutely would. We're always, you know, researching this. I know staff is researching this, but um, I'm not sure if Mr. Kirby's on the phone, but I think that was a, a great piece of information that he gave us at one of our meetings, letting us know that, you know, we might have these great intentions, but we don't necessarily have the authority. To I'm put sorry, rent freezes, to put rent, rent, rent freezes or, or even forgive rent. We can't do that. Thank you, Councilor Mitchell. Councilor Arnold, do you want to add to that? Well, I was going to say, uh, Councilor Mitchell finished, we can't do forgiveness of rent. We can't stop increases. But again, my hope is that we will really be able to work with other jurisdictions to come out with a recovery plan for a way out because we all need a way out. Renters, homeowners, landlords, everyone needs to, we need to figure this out. So I'm hoping that we'll hear more. And again, we can't do it at our level. It's probably done at a best done at at least a state level because it's not a city specific issue and it faces so many people. So again, that's one of the things I'm really hoping that we can come up with some good recovery solutions over time. Thank you, Councilor Arnold. Councilor Beatty, go ahead, please. Yeah, and so while we, we can't do that, there are some things that we can do, which is why uh, Council President Mitchell, when she opened, talked about um, the amount of money that we just approved in the last two weeks that we're pushing out to community action and other um, culturally specific agencies to be able to make sure that those that need this kind of rent assistance can get it. We also are kind of grappling with the size of the issue, right? Like we need to hear from the community about if this is happening to you and, you know, prolonged. All of us have email addresses. You could reach out to city councilors. Give us an idea of what's happening because a lot of renters that I've, or a lot of property owners I've talked to um, are in fear that this is gonna happen, but aren't necessarily seeing it month after month. And I think once unemployment started hitting, once people started getting their stimulus checks, people were able to do it. Now, I'm not saying that that has solved the issue, but we do need to kind of have a, an idea. So if you're out in the community and this is happening, um, send us an email and, and be kind and say it like it's the first time we're hearing it from you because it's likely it is. So we, we would like to know from the community how to address this. Um, so we know where to focus our energy and help. Great. Thank you, Councilor Brady. Mayor Doyle, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Just briefly, a lot of what we can do as a city depends on the COVID funds that were uh, sent to the state and sent to the county. Um, there's a lot of dollars there and we were hoping that more direct aid will come to the cities uh, in the next package. So that may help us solve a lot of these problems. That's why we're trying real hard to make sure that some money does come to every city in Oregon, not just Beaverton. And we're working hard with, with everybody we can. And uh, that may help us a lot if we can identify who needs to help because the landlords have mortgages too. And we, we have to remember that. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Mitchell. And just to kind of go on what the mayor was saying was the, the aid that we're able to provide is in, in a form of a grant. So we know that, you know, to get a loan, to pay off a debt, to, I mean, that's a never ending cycle. And we want to make sure that we can get people out of their, you know, their hole that they're in if they're already in debt. And, and I think that's the, the great place that we're coming from. So. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, moving on to my next question here. 
Uh, Kathy asks, there is a concern regarding the customer requirement of wearing masks after the fatal shooting in Oklahoma of a guard to enforce when a customer refused. Will there be a best practice for establishment employee requirements versus the customer discretion or a change in the language? Councillor Sansusi, I'll let you answer first. Sorry, I think you're still muted. Go ahead now. Yeah, sorry, I, for, I forgot to unmute. Here we go. It's a new world for all of us. So absolutely fresh news today. The governor uh, issued the, the latest round of statewide um, steps that are likely to be taken to allow more businesses to open up over the next week to two weeks to three weeks to four weeks. And while all of the details of that were not published today, uh, I want to just share one, one slide that, that was in the, the presentation that accompanied the governor's address um, that uh, employees in certain businesses where physical distancing cannot be maintained uh, will be required um, to wear masks. So employees will be required to wear masks. And it, they will strongly recommend that those businesses establish a policy mandating that customers do so. Now that's a strong recommendation, that's not a requirement. So the state is not likely at this point to require that customers wear masks when they go into a business. However, they are re recommending that businesses whose employees have to wear masks set that up as a policy. Whether the residents of Oregon respond the way certain, um, let's call them, uh, aggravated gun-toting individuals have responded in other parts of the country remains to be seen. But I sincerely hope not. I really hope that the people of Oregon have a more rational way of approaching this. I know I personally am gonna wear a mask when I go into a retail store until the science has caught up with this virus. And I hope everybody else will do the same. Councillor Fagan, would you like to go next? And then Councillor Mitchell. Sure. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I agree with Councillor Sansusi. I, I am fortunate where uh, my office is about a 10 minute walk from my home. And as an essential business, uh, I still commute to work by foot. Um, and on the THPRD paths that I walk on, it's not quite a six foot distance. So I can, I can go without a mask until I get to those trails. And then I put a mask on just in case uh, we're walking past a jogger or a family. Um, but it goes back also to one of the questions I brought up earlier, which was that the uh, Human Rights Advisory Commission was uh, asking um, whether it's required or not, if we as a city could put together guidance for businesses, uh, for people that were wearing masks, just, just to make sure that if you're wearing a mask going in a store, you feel safe. Thank you, Councillor Fagan. Councillor Mitchell? I think um, two things here. I think that we definitely will explore um, any sort of ordinance or any more information that we can get as far as counselors and what we could do in the city. And I think the other thing to remember is um, when we're out with these masks on um, in Beaverton, you know, I think that we have a great experience with our police department and we have a pretty diverse council. So, you know, we'll definitely have our racial equity lenses on when we're thinking about any sort of strategic approach to this. Um, and, it, you know, just from a human perspective, when, you know, this much of your face is covered, it's difficult to uh, communicate. And I think that's probably a more uncomfortable thing for most of us because you know, it's it, those nonverbal cues are so huge because we don't necessarily as a society talk to each other all the time, you know, so I think being able to adjust to that um, is, or even when you have to talk a little bit louder because maybe you're soft-spoken and you've got this mask on, I think there's a lot of social um, changes that we'll have to adapt to, but I know that council is definitely uh, going to look into this, so. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Arnold, would you like to add on to that? I personally wear them. Again, what I'm still understanding is it, the masks don't protect us, it protects other people. And so that's why I'm, in my heart of hearts, we should all be wearing masks because we need to protect each other. But I did want to ask Captain Roshong to talk a little bit about what we, sh what people should do if they see groups that aren't prop doing social distancing. 
Thank you, Counselor. Yes, um, people, we have been fielding calls. People call uh, the non-emergency dispatch center, center with uh, complaints of people in parks or maybe in parking lots, not uh, properly socially distancing. And we respond to every one of those calls. Uh, our our um, approach to these is um, educate and then warn. And then if at the very um, extreme would be, a, they would receive um, a citation um, for not, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, fortunately, the calls that we've been going to, um, people are very open to education. Um, in fact, I think very few have even had to be warned. I think people in Beaverton understand the severity. And, um, and so uh, we haven't had any issues like some of the things that have been described going on across the country with blatant disregard or, you know, violence, uh, that type of thing. So we've been very fortunate. Thank you, Chief. Okay, next question. Amy asks, did Governor Kate Brown announce that Oregon is opening up on May 15th? Mike Muma, go ahead. Uh, in short, no. <laughs> um, so what was announced is on May 15th, there are a couple of sectors that are opening up statewide. Um, so standalone retail uh, that was previously closed, um, as long as they can follow the OSHA guidelines, um, you know, they can reopen. Uh, but if they fail to uh, establish and maintain the guidelines, then, um, you know, a complaint can be filed and they can be shut down. Uh, the other is childcare, summer school uh, camps, youth programs. Um, but again, there are certain limitations and the expectation that uh, social distancing or excuse me, physical distancing guidelines will be abided by. So it's not a statewide, it's just uh, two more sectors of, um, of the country or state. Thank you, Mike. Councilor Sansusi? Yeah, and again, referring to the governor's um, presentation to the public today and some of the materials that were distributed with that, uh, what happens on May 15th is the first of the counties in the state that are able to meet the criteria for opening up more businesses are likely to meet those criteria. And, and that involves uh, being able to test enough people, being able to do contact tracing, having a small enough number of cases, having a declining number of cases. And uh, the Washington County, Multnomah County, Clackamas County area does not yet meet those criteria. And so uh, it is unlikely that we will be open to the same extent as certain other counties in the state for yet another two or three weeks, probably. It just depends on how quickly things move in the right direction. Thank you, Counselor. Okay, our next question, Adam asks, income from unpaid property taxes later this year, how will that impact the city? Does the county advance the money or just pass through actual collections for city-related property tax items? I'm gonna turn this to our finance director, Patrick Eau Claire. Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, the, the, the caller or the question uh, uh, provider is correct that uh, the city does not collect property taxes. It all goes to the county. And the county uh, uh, allocates property tax revenues to all the districts within the county in proportion to property taxes paid. So no one taxpayer that does not pay their taxes directly impacts in individual taxing districts, um, villages receive those revenues. And just to... Uh, recall everybody's um, um, information about property taxes. Uh, they are due and payable, I believe, on uh, November 15th of 2020 will be the next one that will be uh, uh, becoming due. And um, the city will, will certify what it needs to operate its, its, uh, its, its business on um, July 1st, along with all the other taxing jurisdictions within their permanent rate levy authority. And from that, then the city, uh, the county assessor will uh, then assemble the property tax statements for uh, distribution sometime in the mid part of October. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, our next question, Amy asks, if the transit, transient lodging tax or hotel tax are not going to be as expected, will the plans for the Patricia Reeser Arts Center be modified? Patrick, do you want to take that one? Yes, I'll, I'll shift that question. And uh, uh, one of the other uh, 
direct, uh, city directors might ask, uh, also chime in. So uh, the transient lodging tax is the, um, the basis for the building of the Patricia Research Centers for the art. The city's contribution is going to be uh, uh, paid through a bond issue. And that bond issue is currently scheduled for closing in June. And that will borrow the $21 million uh, that the city's commitment to the uh, project. So the city will have the resources to actually uh, uh, fund its portion of the building, the construction. Um, the payment of that debt will, will happen over the next uh, 20 years. And we do know that transient lodging taxes are decreasing. They're decreasing by almost about 60% in the month of uh, April. Uh, it's continued to go down. Uh, projections are that we should only plan on receiving about 20% of the normal revenues that we expect to receive for the month of April. Um, May and June, and for the next fiscal year, uh, planning about receiving about 60% of what you would have thought you would have received. received. And so we've already adjusted our budgets uh, this year and next year to reflect that. Um, granted that when we do issue the bonds, uh, there will be a debt service that will be need to be paid. We are currently structuring our bond issuance so that the first two years of that bond issue debt service payments uh, will be interest only and then we'll uh, backload the other, uh, the principal payments on the remaining 18 years. And so that will get us over this, this probably about two year period of, of declined uh, uh, transient, lodge, transient lodging tax revenues. But as far as delaying the project, I have not heard anything that is delaying the project or the construction at all. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I'm gonna turn it to Councillor Arnold and then to Cheryl Tweedy. Go ahead, Councillor Arnold. Uh, Cheryl may have more to say about this than I know, but I did get the question about whether we would stop building the Patricia Reeser Center of the Arts because of what's going on. And it doesn't, the answer is no, we're already in the process of building. We, we can't leave it partly built. Also, we've got enough funding that we can at least get through the building component of it. And we are taking into account the loss of the transit lodging tax money, the hotel tax money, um, but we do have a lot of other money coming in as well. So we should be able to get through it. And again, it's hard to stop. And plus, at least we're still providing more jobs. So that's another reason to continue to complete it. Thank you, Councillor. Cheryl, go ahead, please. Uh, that's absolutely correct. I just wanted to add that the project actually started construction last November. So we're about six months into um, almost a two-year construction process. We believe the building will be completed in about June of 2021, so a little over a year from now. And we have worked really hard to keep the construction schedule moving forward and ensuring that um, the, the workers on site can do their jobs in a safe and healthy manner. We've many, made many adjustments uh, to the schedule. We've, we've modified which subs are on site at any particular time. And um, we've even been using robots, believe it or not, to help uh, with the masonry work on the site. So right now we're, we're on schedule, we're moving forward and we're keeping everybody safe out on that site. Great, thank you, Cheryl. It's great to see that building coming up. Our next question. Is there any information on when hiring will happen for contact tracing jobs? And I think as Councillor Beatty mentioned earlier, it might be at a county level rather than a city level. I'm gonna turn it to Councillor Arnold. Go ahead, please. I was gonna say, since no one raised their hands, I guess the answer is no, we don't really know yet. But that's a really important question and again, I'm hoping that uh, different jurisdictions, we can come together and we can come up with a really good plan for how to do this well. One, to protect people to the extent possible and two, to do that tracing when we need to. So keep our fingers Great. crossed that we can all come together and get something done. Thank you, Councillor. I'm gonna turn it over next to HR Director Patricia Wick Anderson, Anderson Wick, sorry, and then to Mike Muma. Go ahead, Patricia. Thank you, Abigail. So, you know, contact tracing jobs are pretty much at a county level where there is county public health. The city does not employ nurses, epidemiologists, or scientists who would be involved in contact tracing. Um, because contact tracing involves finding the infected person, finding everyone with whom that person had contact and helping to isolate them. Um, there are 
nobody, there are no employees in the city who are qualified to do that. However, as a city, we will participate at whatever level we're required to participate in to assist other counties who might be involved in contact tracing, whether it is via record keeping or, um, you know, helping to provide, um, you know, documentation or whatever it is that they need. But we will not be able to provide contact tracing um, ex experts. Thanks, Patricia. Mike, please add as you can. So there is information on the county's website um, where they are looking for volunteers or paid positions for contact tracing. So if you go to the county's website, you can find that information if you're, if you're so interested. And uh, what they're asking for is whether you're, uh, your language, if you're bilingual, um, any contact tracing experience, uh, whether you have any type of medical background like a nurse, um, provide a current resume. Uh, and so they're, they are looking to hire, so that, uh, you, but again, as, um, as director, uh, HR Director Patricia said, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be us doing it, but they are hiring from the public. Great. Thanks, Mike. Councillor Fagan. So if you look at the Q&A pop-up, if you tap on that, we have open, answered, and dismissed. In the dismiss section, we're actually putting links. Is there a way we can put a link to the contract tracing information from the county in that box so that people that are participating can go over and click on a button and get exactly where they want to go? That's a great suggestion. We have uh, Jay, Nicole, and Cece are in the background of this meeting and they can put that there. We can also add it to the city's uh, resources on our website. That's beavertonoregon.gov slash coronavirus. So we can add a link there as well. And that link's in the dismiss section too. Great. Thank you. Okay, our next question. How is city and county spending being prioritized? In hearing about possible school furloughs, what other non-essential programs can be reduced to prevent extensive education cuts? Councillor Beatty? Well, I think this is one of those important lessons of, uh, you know, how the money comes is different. We don't backfill school district funding. That's not um, something we property tax uh, bond for. That is something the school district does. I do know that the school district started their uh, budget committee hearings this week as well. And so I would highly recommend reaching out to school board members. And if people don't know this, you can go right to the school district website. Almost all of their phone numbers is listed directly under their name and their email address for which area they represent. So I would definitely reach out to the school board members. I know um, hearing from school board members in multiple districts, not just Beaverton, they are anticipating a massive loss and shortfall and they are, they are working hard to figure out how they're able to do that. But I would definitely reach out to school board members um, and ask that question because our funding looks different than theirs. Thank you, Council Beatty. We have about 10 minutes left and three more questions. Thank you all for, for being part today, taking part today. So let's see, two more questions, I guess. Pedro asks, okay, we have heard the, we have no power with rent forgiveness, but what can the city do to lobby the state and banks for these big goals? Rent forgiveness for homeowners, tenants, or corporations? All right, not seeing, uh, not seeing a hand raised, I'll let you know that um, I'm going to have Mayor Doyle and then uh, Councillor Beatty, and we can uh, also follow up by email if there's more questions. Uh, Mayor Doyle, please go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> I think one of the things I mentioned earlier is the, the aid coming from the federal government via the, the county, via the state. And again, we'll cut a deal again, compromise on all the different issues to get money to the cities to do exactly that so we can help people pay their rent, get them out of arrears and make sure the landlords can pay their mortgage payments. It's going to be a process, but to me, that's got to happen. And we are all the mayors through the U.S. Conference of Mayors and a whole uh, other cities are putting pressure by the or to make those things happen because it's a great valid point. Somewhere the bills have to be paid. And that's what we need to do for people. And uh, we're, we're pushing hard. And 
I have confidence that we're going to get something done in D.C. And within two weeks that will help us do all that. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Beatty. Yeah, I think this is one of those uh, leadership as influence kind of situation. The mayor and I were both on a call last night with Senator Wyden, who talked um, like about barely leaving his desk working on these issues. And so uh, Congresswoman Bonamici, Senator Merkley, and Senator Wyden have all reached out to local jurisdictions like ours asking, um, you know, they don't know what's happening down at the ground level in every single city. So we're able to kind of give them that information as well as Senator, State Senator Elizabeth Steiner Hayward, who's on the Judiciary Committee, meets with a lot of us weekly to ask what we're seeing and doing. Um, our voice is important in that, but I think also community members reaching out and emailing state senators and state representatives directly with your concern. And I personally always ask at the end of my emails when I'm reaching out, like, I would like a response back, please email me directly. And that way you know that your voice is being heard. But um, it's going to take all of us together. And I know we're, we're doing everything we can from our side, but community members also need to reach out because um, other elected officials are often more um, responsive to community members. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Arnold. Another thing that the National League of Cities and League of Oregon Cities are trying to communicate at the national level is that money should be allocated to all cities. Right now, there's a size limit, and it, it disallows a lot of smaller cities from getting money. We were able to uh, help with rental payments by using some federal money from the Community Development Block Grant money, and that is federal money that we get. And that's what we're using to help with rent. So it doesn't create as we are getting some of city money as well. We've done what 250,000 and another hundred and about 150 that we're going to give directly from our money. But again, we've got to continue those conversations at the national level in order to have money come directly to our cities as well to help with these types of issues. Thank you, Councillor Mayor Doyle. Yeah, just, just to add that, sharing stories is really important. People don't know how valuable that is in terms of sharing it with our, with our federally elected people. And if you know folks in other states that have senators that are saying, no, we don't want to help cities, ask them to communicate with their senators and put some pressure on. Believe it or not, they actually have staff that goes through that kind of email, responds to it, but they definitely get it passed know from firsthand used to work in a Senate office. That is indications. And this, what the cities here in our state have to do is, is get aggregate data, make a case, make it sensible, and pass it on to the electeds, to all seven that we have, the five U.S. representatives and our two senators. They need that information. And it's really, believe it or not, that is very meaningful our Stories. At some point, they're going to have to address it. It's going to, it's going to be a real challenge financially for the state, and we have to realize that, but we've got to figure out ways to help people. And the only way to do that is communicate. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Brady, additional comment? Oh, sorry. I'll lower your hand there. Thanks. Okay. What is the city's reopening plan, and what are the current preparations, and when would that happen? Councillor Arnold? I don't think we have a, a permanent reopening plan, but I want to commend the staff. You've done an excellent job of being able to provide services even without being in person. So the vast majority of our services, other than, of course, being able to use, go in and use the library, they, but even the library still has programs that they're offering to people. Um, but a lot of our standard services about getting answers about development or about your water bill, there's still inspections going on. We figured out how to distance that. So the vast majority of city services are still being provided right now. So that's been a plus for us. Thanks, Councillor. Mayor Doyle and then Councillor Fagan. Mayor, we might have some connection problems. I'm not hearing you. Is it is okay now? Yep, go ahead. Okay. I was saying that we are formulating a plan with staff at all levels from the organization of when we can open. I know we were talking about a target 
of the day after Memorial Day. But that doesn't mean every door in the city is going to open up. We're putting protective uh, equipment there. We have to order masks. A lot of things have to happen, and it'll be a gradual reopening because of the points that Council Arter said. A lot of work still can be done remotely, and this is something, plus we have to take our, our guides from the governor and follow all the standards that Councilor Sansusi has referred to. More than capable of figuring that one out, and as we will go along, a gentle reopening says, whoops, if there's a hiccup, we can go right back a step and wait for that hiccup to disappear. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Fagan, I thought I saw your hand, and now it's down. Did you have a response? Yeah, it was up, and then I brought it down. But uh, <laughs> the, the response was, I think it was in uh, one of the employee emails today that talked about, uh, you know, we, we had the staff had formed a, a pandemic response team, and that uh, now they've formed a opening team. Mm -hmm. And so the staff is working on how do we open, how do we do it safely, how do we keep the employees safe, and how do we keep the public safe? And safety's safety's the key. I don't know if any of the, the other staff people on that team want to talk about what, what that looks like. All right. Thanks, Councillor. I'm going to turn it next to our HR director, Patricia, and then over to Mike. Well, I, I may be repeating what Mike says, so I'll make mine short and defer to him. But I want to say that I have personally been impressed with the fact that we have a multidisciplinary team of talented employees who are learning as they go. They're bringing also their... their um, former knowledge to the table, and there is quite a bit of interest from each employee group in ensuring that we open with safety and security um, being foremost, and also that we're providing services to the city in a very safe manner while we are also um, observing physical distancing, um, ensuring that the correct level of service is not compromised, and it's, it's quite exciting to see, but I can, I can say that we should rest assured that staff, um, our staff members are actually thinking about this. They're working together and they're learning as they go along. They're doing a lot of reading. Mike has been leading us really effectively in this. And I have every um, confidence that when we open and as we open in phases, that it will, will be well done. Great, thank you, Patricia. Mike? Yeah, I just want to clarify um, the term uh, city's reopening plan because it can actually be defined as two. Some may see it as um, all the businesses and going back to normal in the city versus all opening of city services. So to, to clarify the two roles, um, going back to normal, getting together, restaurants and that, that's got to be part of the countywide plan. Uh, we will take our lead from them when they hit those uh, thresholds that are required by the governor um, and apply. And Patricia have covered that well. We do have a, a multidiscipline team working on that. Um, we have um, actually Renata Garrison, uh, my uh, emergency management officer, is chairing that, uh, that team. And um, they are working quite well to address all the concerns of both employees and customers of how we can continue to provide services, bring back some of the services that have been suspended, but do it safely for the employee and the customer. Great. Thank you, Mike. I recommend everyone keep an eye on the city website for more details of specific services and programs and, and when uh, things start to reopen. It's not going to look exactly like it did back in February, but we're going to have a phased uh, and safe approach. Uh, so I think there's uh, time for one last question, and then I'll ask if anyone has any uh, closing comments that they want to make sure or questions that didn't get answered. I think our last question is a police question. Do police officers receive additional training on COVID-19 protection? And if so, can we have a description of that training? Thank you. Um, so when this all uh, first broke, we, we were much like everyone else, like, what does this mean for, for us? And uh, what we've done is take, taken best tips and practices from CDC, our own emergency operations center on how to keep safe, wearing masks when, when entering homes, social distancing, uh, wearing gloves, um, being very mindful um, about, you know, how, how we close we come into contact with a complainant or a victim or, or any community member. We also rely heavily on our um, 
partner agencies, um, TVFNR, Washington County Sheriff's Office, and what are they doing? What are their best what are their best practices and, and what can we learn from each other to keep us safe and our community safe, those we serve safe. Um, so as far as specific training, other than um, just what, what, what I've already said, there's really no specific training. Just be very mindful and, and uh, very careful on each and every call and contact that we go on. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate all the work you and, and everyone on the, in the department has been doing these last couple weeks. Thank you. Any, any other comments or things we've missed? And then I have one more question for all of you. Oh, it looks like I have a note that says uh, CC Ritter would like to answer the question. Uh, no? Okay, Mayor Doyle, go ahead. Remind everybody, today's Thursday is for our local restaurants who are open for pay encourage you to do that and do it more than once a week. My dinner is due to five minutes. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Sansusi. Well, to the point the mayor just made last night, we did some takeout from one of downtown Beaverton's fine restaurants, and it was very well prepared, and it was very safely delivered to, or wasn't delivered to us, but it was very safely handed over to us. Uh, it's very nice to see that at least some Beaverton businesses have figured out how to work under the current circumstances. And fortunately, it looks like circumstances for, for local businesses are going to start to improve over the next few weeks, which is great. That's great. Thank you, Councillor Sansusi. Councillor Arnold? These times are hard. I said in my oath of office back in January of 2017 that as human beings, we can be faster. It's easier and faster for us to go into fear and smear than courage and compassion. I had no idea that we would be seeing the type of issues we have now. And at our city level, at our county level, at our national level, even I think at our world level, I think it's gonna take a lot of courage and compassion us putting problems aside, us recognizing that fighting with each other over things is not going to help. We need to do everything that we can to help at every level we can, starting with our community, to Councillor Sansusi's point, take out food, uh, continue to pay for uh, your club, uh, if you're a member of a gym, if you can still afford to do things, every little bit is going to help. And again, I hope that we can be reaching out to our neighbors and that we can find ways that we can have those moments of light and joy that occur when we are helping other people. And I get to do Meals on Wheels tomorrow. And I have to tell you, doing it last month was absolutely the most touching thing I, uh, touching that day ever in 20 years of doing Meals on Wheels is reaching out in these times. So if you have time, they also need people who are willing to talk with folks on their Meals on Wheels list just to check in with them on wellness checks. That's something you can do over the phone. So if you have some spare time and want to help your community, you can look there. And I'm sure there's other places as well where we can do small acts to keep us all afloat. Great. Thank you, Councilor Arnold. Councilor Mitchell. I just want to say thank you to all of the staff that put this call together and all of our residents who took the time and had the ability to join us. It's been a great time. So I'm glad that we were able to get together tonight. So thank you guys. Thanks, Counselor. Glenn? Glenn Ferdman, yeah, Library Director. I'd like to take yeah. this opportunity to uh, all the residents on the line that while we are currently staying home in compliance with the governor's order, to uh, please avail yourself of the opportunity to go to the library's website, um, beavertonlibrary.org, where we have a full array of digital resources and online library programs and events for all ages. So hope to see you online. Thank you, Glenn. I think I heard you say earlier that the library's uh, online programming has been viewed on YouTube more than 10,000 times. That is correct, Abigail. Really 10,000 and counting. That's awesome, that's great. So those are our questions and, and comments. Thank you all so much. If there were additional questions or folks think of some later, um, you can send them to public information at beavertonoregon.gov, like government. Again, that's public information at beavertonoregon.gov. And of course, coronavirus resources and city links are available on our website, www.beavertonoregon.gov.
slash coronavirus. Thank you all so much for attending and thank you all to uh, our elected officials and our uh, staff colleagues for being on this uh, session today. I'm gonna ask all the panelists to stick around. I think we're gonna take a photo of all of you after the public is gone. So thank you all so much. Stay home, uh, stay safe, stay healthy and take care of each other. Have a great night. <laughs>